Your power's a weak old man. You can't win, Darth. If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> Hey, my patrons, I usually don't read this long of an article. Normally, if I'm going to do it this long, I would mark it up. And if you don't get it, maybe I can come back and revisit it and mark it up visually. But uh, this is an extension of the internal slave trade video I did publicly. This one is for you. This one um, should be quite interesting, quite interesting, because it's something that I didn't know. But let's get into the article and we'll talk about it. Uh, this is uh, Thomas Jefferson did more to promote domestic slavery and slave breeding than any other president and got rich doing it. While the current trade war between Donald Trump and China keeps making the news, there's another trade war guided by Thomas Jefferson we never heard about. That one led to protectionist pricing and massive exportation of what became Virginia's greatest export, not tobacco, but slaves. Jefferson is considered by some the father of the Constitution, though he didn't write a word of it. He was serving as the minister to France at the time and wasn't present at the Constitutional Convention. It was James Madison who drafted the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights. Jefferson was still a great influence, having mostly written the Declaration of Independence and drafts for the Virginia Constitution. His drafts didn't arrive in time to be considered in the actual document but became part of the foundation for the Bill of Rights when Madison composed them. His view on gun rights made their way into the Constitution. A close reading suggests his views on guns might be tied to slavery and the need for owners to maintain order. Ah, listen to that. A close reading suggests his view on guns might be tied to slavery and the need for owners to maintain order. No free man shall ever be debarred from the use of arms with his own lands and tenements. The Constitution contained a clause that Jefferson made full use of to enrich not only himself, but also fellow Virginia slave owners. That clause was a compromise with South Carolina, which allowed them to continue importing African slaves for no less than 20 years. By the time of the American Revolution, a combination of burned out fields due to poor crop rotation and the loss of their best customer, Britain, meant that Virginia in particular had too many slaves, while South Carolina and other southern states more reliant on rice and sugar barely had enough. Charleston had become the largest port for receiving African slaves, which were, they were getting relatively cheaply. This reduced the value of Virginia slaves, which farmers we're breeding, I'll come back to that, and selling to states with greater needs. If Jefferson and other Virginians and some New Englanders had their way, the international slave trade would have stopped right along with the adoption of the Constitution. The clause that gave southern states a 20-year pass was to entice the southern states, especially South Carolina, to join the Union. Mmm, interesting. Keep in mind, none of those illustrious founding fathers wanted to get rid of slavery. They just wanted to limit it to the homegrown kind and keep the prices up. Also interesting. Thomas Jefferson, who owned over 600 slaves in his lifetime, was chief among them. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by Congress prior to the year 1808 but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation not exceeding $10 for each person. They put a tariff on fucking the importation of slaves. Perfect. Constitution of the United States, Article 1, Section 9. For the next 20 years, Virginia and South Carolina, with Maryland a distant third, competed to provide the rest of the nations with slave. Interesting. Virginia and Maryland selling off their excess, South Carolina reselling the Africans fresh off the boat. 
South Carolina knew they had a short window to work with. Also interesting. Nobody knew at the time that some unruly slaves in St. Dominique, later Haiti, led by Toussaint Louverture, would take over the place and give Napoleon such a bad taste in his mouth that he soured on America with all of his black people and arranged to sell off Francis Holding there with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. White folks had already been encroaching on land north of New Orleans and west into Tennessee to Kentucky and elsewhere. Fertile land was begging to be farmed with the help of slaves, of course. Who had slaves? Virginia, Maryland, and South Carolina. Back to that trade war. Though the stage had been set with the finalization of the Constitution in 1787, it only provided that the international slave trade could not be ended prior to 1808. Somebody still had to actually make that happen, which is where Thomas Jefferson steps in. 1800, Jefferson was elected president, assuming office in 1801. He was still president in 1808, when that constitutional prohibition against ending the international slave trade expired. He didn't wait that long. Getting all the paperwork and legislation out of the way a year early in 1807. In his address to Congress, he denounced, that's why, he, that's why they said yeah, Thomas Jefferson hated slavery, because he ended, he ended the slave trade. <laughs> this is interesting, right? He's this great dude that hated slavery, right? After we reread history, but when you read deep into it, it had nothing to do with it. It had something to do with war. It's also the same thing when you read into history with Lincoln. These niggas wasn't no, these niggas, these Bastards weren't weren't any saints. I can't even call them niggas because that's too lofty of a title for them. In his address to Congress, he denounced the violations of human rights imposed on the Africans, surely giving no thought to how much richer he and his fellow slaveholding Virginians would be once those pesky South Carolinas were eliminated as rivals. I congratulate you, fellow citizens, on the approach of the period at which you may interpose your authority constitutionally to withdraw the citizens of the United States from all further participation in those violations of human rights, which have been so long continued on the unoffending inhabitants of Africa, and which the morality, the reputation, and the best interests of our country have long been eager to proscribe. I don't mean to suggest Jefferson was insincere. Well, actually, I do. While he claimed to be so concerned about the human rights, morality, and reputation, he was fathering several children with one of his slaves. Family members, despite DNA evidence, held all the children weren't his. Some might have been his brother's children because loaning out one's property was in vogue back in the day. Finally, in 2017, an organization representing the Jefferson family acknowledged that he fathered six children with Sally Hemings, who he started raping when she was 14. Okay, raping is probably a little strong a word, but hey, what the hell. Getting rid of the international slave trade instantly made domestic slave traders like Jefferson much richer. Jefferson banned the shipment of slaves to America from Portugal, Spain, France, Britain, and the Dutch, so that America would get a better price for its homegrown slaves, eliminating a major source of competition because the demand for slaves was still high due to the nation's rapid expansion. America's dirty secret was that they forcibly bred slaves. I said I'd come back to this. To supply the southern and those more western states that had adopted slavery, it was no different than banning all foreign cars to improve the market for domestic vehicles, except that cars weren't a product of forcible rape in many cases to keep the production line going. In 1808, America banned the import of slaves from Africa and the West Indies. Those who are devoted to propping up the image of Thomas Jefferson, they say his ending the international slave trade was the first step toward ending slavery itself. The fact it greatly increased his wealth was simply a byproduct. They cite his writings and his speeches about the evils of slavery. Of the over 600 slaves he owned in his lifetime, he freed only seven. Two while he was living, one of whom 
pay $200 for his release. They say Jefferson would never be involved in something as heinous as slave breeding, even though he enacted the law that greatly expanded the practice. I'll let Jefferson have the last word and you decide. I consider a woman who brings a child every two years is more profitable than the best man of the farm. What she produces it is in addition to the capital, while his labors disappear in mere consumption. That's from Thomas Jefferson. When you read real history, they start digging into the details, and you read the circumstances around a historical moment or historical period, a lot of the devils start popping up. This is one of the devils. Thomas Jefferson's name has pretty much been cleansed. Just like years from now, George Bush's or Donald Trump's or even Barack Obama's name will be cleansed. But if when you read the actual history during the actual period, um, you'll know that these are just dudes. These are just guys trying to line their pocket, trying to do business. Uh, what did Deep Throat say in during the um, during the uh, uh, the Nixon era? Follow the money. Before Nixon got impeached, follow the money. You follow the money. You follow the resources, you follow the need, nine times out of ten, you'll find out what the real story is. Even with Lincoln, when I did stuff on Lincoln, find out Lincoln didn't free the slaves because he wanted to. Lincoln had a very particular reason for what he did. And once you figure out uh, why he did what he did, then you then you guys to get a more of an idea. The wealth was in the South. All the money was in the South. All the money was in the West. Slaves helped build the South and the West. They helped expand the country. And this narrative that they imported all these slaves, you know, millions of slaves, and that um, America was forced to cut off the slave trade, they were externally. Um, I, you know, even I didn't really guess what was happening. I mean, for most of my life, I accepted the narrative until I started looking at the data. So I looking at the data and said, this doesn't make sense. How did you get such a big explosion, a tenfold explosion, you know, over this, this period between 1780 and 1860? It doesn't make sense, right? Until you get dig into the details. The devil is always in the details. These are the details. This is what all the data has been pointing to. And this brother, you know, I don't know what his background is or what the rest of his work is. It might be totally unrelated to this, but the thing is, he's done the work. He's done the digging of bringing us this detail. This is one more piece of the puzzle. So it gives us another link in the chain to our history, to our knowledge of self, about who we are, why we exist, and how our history still bites us in the ass, right? So now we can actually acknowledge what happened to us and get rid of the old false narratives, all the fairy tales that they've been feeding us and use real history to heal us. We are a created people. We are bred like animals. That is a fact. It is, it is a cruel fact. And it's hard to accept that, that a group of people will do that to another people. But the world is cruel like that. You know, uh, they wiped out the Native Americans. They, there were 75 million when they came here. There's only 3 million now. They wiped them out completely. They basically committed genocide on the Native American people. That is a cruel fact. It's one that has to be lived with. These are facts that we have to live with. We are a bred people, intentionally bred people. This is the dirty little secret that has been floating around forever. But nobody wanted to dig into the data and actually tell the story, the real history. A lot of people have hinted at this, but they sensationalized it. They made it, oh, the white man's the boogeyman, which I have no problem with calling this an evil act. But the thing is, it's an evil act for, for basic reasons that human beings go through, just like the Africans that sold us. And they lied about it. Everybody's hands are dirty. But we need for us as a people to heal to know the truth. That mama and daddy wasn't no saint, okay? Anyway, y'all, I know it's been a long article. I'm going to put this up for your perusal. Uh, 
as per our agreement it'll be a couple of weeks before this goes out public but this one is for you guys so i'm gonna leave it here this is bgs out and i'll see you guys on the next one